Hector Retreat. The fact that so many people are planning to participate in this indicates that you all love Metta. Where in fact it is. There can be occasionally somebody who doesn't like it. Long ago, somebody, a woman, invited me to give a retreat in Poland. neighbor of Ukraine. And then she asked me, what kind of retreat do you conduct? I said, inside meditation, dharma meditation, and uh, metta meditation. As soon as she heard the word metta meditation, she said, I hate metta. So, because she must have come from a very unpleasant background, maybe due to the Second World War. Anyway, I went there and led a 10 day metta retreat. At the end, this woman was so deeply taken up. With Metta, she invited me again to <laughs> Metta retreat. Can you imagine that there could be anybody on earth who doesn't like Metta? Friends, it is such a hard, softening practice. And therefore, Buddha has given uh, uh, qualities and qualification for metta practice. It is difficult for everybody to practice, but it is possible that everybody can try. The qualities of metta practice is given in metta sutta. We call karaniya metta. Karaniya means to be done. Metta is not something to recite. Although we recite it, it is something to be done. And it starts with these words, one is skilled in good, wishing to attain that state of peace should act thus. One is skilled in good. We have to be very skillful in being good. <laughs> it is not easy to be good. Because our mind, even though mind is originally pure and luminous, it has been bombarded by various adventitious defilements. And therefore it is not very easy to be skillful. So one has to be skillful. Skillful in what? skillful in attaining that peace, the goal of our practice. Our goal of our practice, our life is peace. It is not very easy to achieve peace if we are not skillful. It is just like sailing in a rough sea where there are whales, sharks, and other animals, wind, and uh, maneuvering through all this to reach the other shore is not very easy. 
life is like that. Although the goal we have intuition about the goal, achieving that goal is not easy if we are not skillful. So the Buddha said in the first place, one skill in good. That is the first qualification. We have to be skillful. That means we have to use our wisdom eye to see the path correctly, to follow, follow it. And that person should act thus, Buddha said. What are the qualities? One should be able, able to practice metta. Many people, as I mentioned, want to practice metta, but they are not able. Because of various background, life condition. And therefore, that person must strive hard, make effort to be able to practice metta. Able. And then one must be straight. in thoughts, words, deeds. This is not something we do just to please somebody. But we do to achieve a goal. For that we have to be honest, sincere, and straight, straight, and then upright. It is another condition that we all must have to practice metta, upright. Then obedient. Suvarte. Obedient to what? Obedient to whom? Obedient to parents? Obedient to teachers? Here obedient means obedient to Dhamma. We must be obedient to Dhamma. If you are not obedient to Dhamma, we will be delinquent. We are trying to cheat the Dhamma. We cannot cheat Dhamma. And we have to be 100% honest and sincere and obedient to Dhamma. Then, gentle, you know, if, the, if a person is very rough, tough, proud, arrogant, that person cannot practice metta. That person's heart doesn't melt. That person doesn't have a soft heart, soft word, soft thought, soft attitude. So the person has to be gentle, inward, inwardly, always one must be flexible, adjustable, accommodating in order to practice metta. If you stay rough and tough, all the time without 
considering any other person's feelings. If other person honor and dignity, if the person does not respect others, you cannot practice metta. So you have to be gentle. And then humble. We have to be humble enough to practice metta. This quality doesn't make us anything less than ourselves if we are humble. And um, trying to treat others equally, kindly, softly. And then gentle and humble. Then you should be content. If the person is discontent, demanding, demanding always, that person cannot practice metta. When somebody wants another individual, always provide things for oneself, then one cannot practice metta. It is discontentment make the person very unpleasant to others. things from people all the time, people think this monk is very unkind. He is not considering, thinking, he is not, he doesn't understand our problem. You know, we practice metta, Metta practice is uh, called universal practice. Why it is universal? Because the suffering is universal. If the suffering is universal, Metta also must be universal. If I demand from people, too many things for my own personal comfort, I don't have compassion, metta, because I don't understand their suffering. They have to work hard, earn hard for paying their own bills to live their own life and support their families. And if I demand things from them, too many things, there is an additional trouble to them. That they are not practicing metta. When I eat, I must think of the people who provided this food brought this food to the table. I have to have metta, compassion for them. When I drink, when I wear the robes, I must think of them. And therefore when I am content, it is easy for them to support me as the next quality. 
is insupportable, easy to support. When we are, when we are content, easy to support. It is not only the monastic, even lay community, lay people in families. If every family member is content, no family member will be a burden upon the other family members. Therefore, they can practice metta very easily towards each other. Then, this is another quality, few duties. In this few duty principle is good not only for the monastic, but as lay people as well. When they, when they if they are hand on every tiny little thing here and there, they cannot do even one of them correctly, properly, perfectly. And their life will be very confused. They cannot practice metta <laughs> when their life is so confused, so many things they have to do. So the people monastic as well as lay people must select the duties necessary for their living, survival. If they undertake so many things, they cannot practice metta. It is difficult. The Buddha was so enlightened, he makes things easy for us to practice. It is us who make our life difficult. So the metta practice is very easy if we have few duties, few responsibilities, and living lightly, not trying to live a very uh, confused life. And then, control senses, controlling our senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. Uncontrolled senses can make life very miserable. It is difficult to practice metta. And then, discreet, not impudent. That means very courteous. Uh, when we are courteous, it expresses our loving friendliness easily. And we can do that in our thoughts, words and deeds. And then, uh, not imprudent, this is another thing that perhaps lay people cannot practice. This is for the monastic it is, it is sort of easy to practice. That is, unattached to families. Kuleshu Ananugintu. Unattached to families. That means if we attach to one family, we neglect the other. When we practice metta, we cannot do that. We have to have an equal attitude towards all families. And then, unattached to families, Last thing is, one should not do any slight wrong which the wise might censor. That means when we do wrong thing, wise, the wise will censor us, then that censoring would 
hurt us, then we develop irritation, anger towards the person who censored us. And therefore, we have to remain always mindful in order to practice metta. Now these are the 15 qualities that we have to cultivate in us before we practice metta. <laughs> Therefore metta practice is not easy. Although we say, I practice metta, it is so delicate, so delicate, that I have heard people say sometimes, I practice metta to everybody but that guy. That is how it is. So difficult. Because anger keeps coming back again and again and again and again when you try to practice better. And therefore, it's a very delicate thing. No matter how delicate it is, if we strive hard, at least we can have this thought when we go to sleep. In meditation, this thought is a wonderful thought so that you can gain concentration. You can have a very successful, peaceful meditation when you have metta. Now let us see what the Buddha asked us to do with these 15 qualities. Suppose we have fulfilled all these 15 qualities. I wish you all read the Metta Sutta translation. You can never ever find any other system where Metta teaching has been so clearly elucidated, explained, described, like in this Metta Sutta. Nowhere else. I guarantee you will never find any other place, any other system which explains Metta so precisely and make it so perfect. Now let us see what the Buddha said. May all we all recited this. Friends, we recite this in this place several times a day. And in our retreats we recite this recital, method recital. But I wonder whether everybody recites them with feeling. We have to recite the metta of recital with the metta feeling, metta attitude. Even for temporary short periods of time, when we recite these passages, there are uh, ten stanzas in the Metta Sutta. If we recite each stanza, with the real feeling, that moment our heart becomes very soft and gentle and kind, even for that moment. The first line, may all beings be happy and secure, not only happy, let them be secure, secure emotionally, Secure financially, secure healthily, may this be secure in from all directions, from all angles, may they be secure and be happy. It's a very ideal wish. And May all beings have happy minds, not sad minds. 
not mindful of sorrow, lamentation, grief, pain and despair. Let them all have happy mind. This very moment, the moment we are reciting, at least at that moment, wherever living beings are there, may they have happy minds for that moment, at least for that moment. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, without exception, if we accept one single being, then our practice is not perfect, without exception. Uh, then the categories are given, weak or strong, weak or strong. It is sometimes easy for us to practice metta to the, to the weak, not to the strong, because we have some uh, belief, idea that the strong are intimidating the weak. Therefore, weak deserve metta, not the strong, the strong, the strong person. So Buddha said, practice metta for whether they are weak or strong. Then another category, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross. Long like reptiles, red, large like elephants, medium like others, and uh, short, small beings, and subtle or gross. Visible or invisible? Visible, we can practice metta. For but we have to remember that there are trillions of invisible beings. Visible are very few compared to invisible. There may be animals, divine beings, ghosts, goblins, we don't know. There can be all kinds of beings in the universe. And may all, the, all of them be happy and subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far. Practice in mental for those who are close to us. Uh, people think it's easy by saying, uh, I have metta for you, I love you, and so forth. But those who are far away, we don't know. We cannot preclude them from our mind just because of their not visible or not close to us. Then, born or coming to birth, it's easy to practice sometimes towards beings who are born, but uh, Sometimes we neglect, ignore, or just don't care for those who are coming to birth. Friends, this is also very uh, delicate. Uh, as, as I mentioned, mental practice is very delicate. Uh, because uh, we don't care for those beings who are in the process of taking birth. And the Buddha wanted us to practice metta even towards them. And may all, all of them have happy minds. Those who are living are born and those who are coming to birth, may they also have happy minds. Then, let no one deceive another. We may de not deceive others. At the same time, we must wish. 
others, not to deceive others. Uh, so, no despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will. Should anyone wish harm to her? Sometimes people can ask her, when we, can we have ill will without, uh, what do you call it? without uh, uh, neither, neither from anger nor ill will, should anyone wish harm to others? Can we have ill uh, can we have, can we wish harm to others without ill will? Neither from anger nor ill will, should anyone wish harm to others? So people sometimes ask, can we have anger towards somebody without ill will or without uh, or can we have can we wish harm to others without ill will or without anger? No. We cannot wish harm to anybody without ill will or without anger. Then as a mother who is her own life to protect the only child. This is another delicate point. Mothers have love towards their own children, but they cannot have love towards other children the same way they have love towards their own children. In, in, a, in, in practice, it doesn't happen. When your child is doing well in school, your neighbor's child doing better than your child, don't you have some jealousy? Aren't you jealous of the other child who is better than your child? So can, therefore, in, a, in, a, in, in practice, can a mother any mother love every child in the whole world equally? In reality, it doesn't happen. Therefore, what does this mean? This person mean? As a mother who risk her own life to protect her only child. Here, child is our metta. Metta is our child. So, we have to protect that metta just like the mother protects her only child and even at the risk of her own life. I tell you uh, an example. There was a, a woman called Samavati who was practicing metta. She had metta retreat every week and with uh, another 500 women. It is the, the, the story of the Buddha's time story. And there was another woman who was jealous of her, uh, set fire to the hall where all these 500 women were meditating, practicing metta, metta meditation. <clears throat> and then everybody 
consume in the fire. And when they were all dying in the fire, Samavati said, Sisters, this is the time to practice metta. Our body dies, body, bodies are, bodies will be burned, but we should not hurt our metta practice towards the person who set fire to this building to kill all of us. That means even at the risk of a not only their children, but risk of their own lives. At that moment, she said, this is the moment that we should protect our metta. That's a beautiful example for this. That means, when we practice metta, that is our, the most important thing, more important than our life. Because if we die in the fire in this life, but our metta prevails, and we will not have anger in our mind. If we die with anger, we will be reborn in a very bad place. If we die with metta, we will be reborn in a beautiful place. And death also will be very peaceful death. And therefore, that is the meaning of this passage. As a mother who risks her own life to protect her only child, even so, towards all living beings, one should practice living planet. One should practice living pregnancy, should not hurt the metta practice towards all living beings. Then, uh, one should cultivate for the entire world a heart of boundless living pregnancy. Now, entire world here means entire universe where there are living beings. We don't know how many are there, but for all living beings we have to cultivate. Then this is the real practice given ten directions. This is called directional practice. What is the ten direction? Uh, above, below and all around. Above, below and all around. That means ten direction, east, north, southeast, south, southwest, west, northwest, north, and northeast. And up and down, ten direction. This is the practice Buddha has mentioned in many places. When you practice, we normally practice metta towards ourselves first. But in most places, Buddha has mentioned to practice metta towards all ten directions first. For instance, when you practice, when you wish, May all beings in the eastern direction be well, happy and peaceful. We have to understand that eastern direction has no limit. Eastern direction is infinite. No, there is no limit to it. And the living being in the eastern directions are also unlimitable, limitless. We don't know how many are there in the eastern direction. Similarly, southeastern direction also no limit. Southern direction no limit. And so forth, all these ten directions have no limit. 
Similar uh, at the same time, the living being in those ten directions are illimitable. So when we practice this method this way, may, for instance, we say may all beings in the eastern direction be very happy and peaceful, uh, southeast direction, southern direction, southwest direction, western direction, northwestern direction, northern direction, northeastern direction, up and down. When you keep practicing mental like this for a while, and then when you return to you, your mind is already full of metta. Because you ignore yourself and you spread metta towards all, then you will be completely filled with metta. And sometimes people say you have to cultivate metta within yourself and spread it to others. But when you try to cultivate metta to ourselves first, sometimes it is possible that we will develop our own self-centeredness. Self-centeredness. If somebody can practice metta towards oneself without uh, having ego, ego-centered, egotistic attitude, then it is okay. But if not, if they have problem in doing that, then they must start with practicing metta towards all beings outwardly. And then return to oneself, then one's mind would be filled with metta practice. Then this is another thing. Uh, unobstructed, without hatred or resentment. Now, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, when or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. You know, when the mind is filled with metta, It will not be interrupted while walking, sitting, standing, lying down, or when away. Because that is, we will be completely engulfed with metta. Heart is filled with metta. It remains in us all the time. Whenever away, and when we go to sleep, of course we forget it, but even the sleep becomes very peaceful sleep. When we talk about the benefit of metta, you can hear that later on. So, develop this mindfulness, this metta is called mindfulness. Mindfulness practice. Why metta is called mindfulness practice? Because we have to be mindful of the suffering of all living beings. As I mentioned earlier, when we are aware of the suffering of all living beings, including ourselves, we can practice metta. Therefore, metta and mindfulness are used here synonymously. They are not two separate practices. And then this could be divided when in here. Living a divine life on earth, we live divine life on earth. That is why it is called Brahma Vihara. Brahma here means the best or highest. Vihara means living. <coughs> Brahma Vihara means highest living or best kind of living. Best kind of living or highest living is living with metta. I think friends, uh, our time is up, I, you, have, you heard the bell. We have only a couple of uh, words to say, but I restrain my 
Russian and the English dog. And uh, I hope we take this very seriously and keep looking at this discourse again and again and again and think of it. Uh, and then you will see how much, how rich this uh, discourse is. With this, I want to conclude this talk.